Uh, welcome to another session of uh, Emerging Research in the Humanities, uh, presented by the uh, Center for Humanities and the Public Sphere. So our speaker today is Dr. Alyssa Cole. She's an assistant professor in Ameri African American Studies, specializing in the intersections of history, health activism, and black communities in the Midwest. Dr. Cole completed her PhD in history at the University of Kansas, where she also received an MA in the African and African American Studies. Dr. Cole's research focuses on health activism, exploring the historical context and contemporary implications of black individuals and communities advocating for better health outcomes. Her current work, Movement Before the Movement, Black Women's Health Activism in Kansas City, 1900 to 1940, explores the roles of black women who advocated for health equity during the early 20th century. Her research examines the intersections of race, class, and gender, highlighting black individuals' agency in pursuing health equity. Dr. Cole was a recipient of a Rothman Faculty Fellowship from the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. And her talk today will present the work that was supported by that fellowship. It's entitled, Empowering Voices, Healing Communities, Black Women's Medical Activism in Early 20th Century Kansas City. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, everybody. Please let me know if I need to speak up a little bit. Um, so before I go into my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I arrived at this um, research that I'm doing right now. I actually started my PhD program as a military historian. Um, I studied 20th century US military. Um, and I wanted to look at what women's roles were during the Vietnam War. And as I did more research, I went back to World War II, I went back to World War I, and when I arrived at World War I, I discovered the US government's failure to take care of veterans coming back. Um, and as well as the new medical technologies that were being developed because of um, issues that these soldiers experienced during the war. And that's how I transitioned to the history of medicine and health in the United States. Um, I found a newspaper article uh, from 1919, Kansas City, and then that sparked a whole, like, you know how you go down those wormholes where you'll be researching and then you go, you know, um, I was just able to do it <laughs> with my dissertation. So that is how I arrived at this point. Um, I'm going to publish my work with Johns Hopkins University. Um, I think, I'm hoping to have the manuscript finished by the end of this year. So my work is a history of black women's support of the medical profession in the West during the early 20th century. While discussing medical institutions and history, I focus on the role that women played in creating a microbe hospital movement and developing a, the medical profession in Kansas City. My work disrupts the discussion of the national black hospital movement of the 1920s by predating this movement by two decades. It tells us about the professionalization of medicine in the West and the rise of medical practices, but it also, um, but also about how communities accessed healthcare during the early 20th century and the role that black women had in establishing the medical profession. This, okay, we're good to go, thank you. <laughs> In early research on this subject, I discovered the Black Hospital Movement of the 1920s, the development of Tuskegee Veterans Hospital in Tuskegee, Alabama, and the arguments surrounding segregated medical facilities. During this research and using both quantitative and qualitative analysis, I found that the development of Black hospitals led to increased mortality rates among African Americans nationwide, particularly in the rural South. Before the development of Black hospitals, Whites only hospitals would generally accept black patients in the event of an emergency. 
But once these communities and governments established black hospitals, whites only facilities no longer accepted black patients in emergencies, even if the only hospital that would serve them was hours away. Newspapers nationwide provided details about African Americans who died after being turned away for treatment at public hospitals. One newspaper from Kansas City stated that a black man who arrived for treatment at St. Luke's Hospital was turned away. He died from a heart attack because he was not treated promptly. This newspaper article led me to the black hospitals in the greater, greater Kansas City area. I initially planned a study that included all of the hospitals in Kansas City, including the John Lang Hospital, General Hospital Number no. 2, Wheatley Provident, and Douglas Hospital. Using historian Vanessa Northington Gamble's guidelines distinguishing black hospitals that were black established and run from black hospitals that were established by local governments and run by white administration, I decided to focus my work on the black hospitals that black physicians and their communities established. These hospitals include the Douglas Hospital in Kansas City, Kansas, and Wheatley Provident Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. In my work, I look at Black institutions and organizational development and study how Black communities and, importantly, Black women organize to address their social, economic, and political conditions. Early on, I found that these hospitals were founded decades before the more widely known Black hospital movement of the 1920s. Physicians founded Douglas Hospital in 1898, and Dr. John Edward Perry began his work at Perry Sanitarium, which later became Wheatley Provident Hospital in the first decade of the 20th century. Scholars have written about the black hospitals in Kansas City with an edited volume titled Wide Open Town, being the most recent publication focused on General Hospital Number no. 2. These works focus mainly on the physicians and politicians involved in the hospitals, and I wanted to know more about community involvement. Early in my research, I found that Frederica Perry, who also happens to be the granddaughter of Frederick Douglass, and, the, and she's also the wife of Dr. John Edward Perry, played a significant role in the development and longevity of these black established hospitals. Frederica organized the Wheatley, the Wheatley Provident Hospital Beacon Club which was an organization of women who supported the nursing school at Wheatley Provident Hospital. This, con this club consisted of a small group of women who raised money to purchase a building to house nurses who worked at the hospital. Though the institution was sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce in 1918, which provided funds for hospital maintenance, Perry's organizations found it necessary to continue their fundraising efforts. The Ladies Auxiliary of Wheatley Provident Hospital raised $5,000, which today would be $99,000, to pay off the mortgage of the building. And the Beacon Club raised $2,500, or $49,000 in today's money, to purchase the nurse's home, while other local organizations supported the hospital by donating furniture. Frederica Perry also opened a home for girls to prevent juvenile delinquency. In addition to continuing work as a substitute teacher, Perry was chairman of the Kansas City Civic Protective Association, supervisor of the Missouri Association of Colored Girls, and national chairman of the National Association of Colored Girls. She established the Big Sister Association and Big Sisters Home for Homeless Girls in Kansas City and organized the John Brown Memorial Association uh, Memorial Association while also participating in the YWCA. In her work as chairman of the Kansas City Civic Association, Perry became frustrated by the refusal of the local NAACP to support the fair trial of an African-American man accused of murder. Perry raised funds herself through the Civic Protective Association and saved his life. According to her biography, she, quote, led five different groups in securing funds for legal service, all in life-saving cases, winning each time. Perry also served as a state treasurer and later state organizer of the Frederick Douglass Historical and Memorial Association. Primary source research repeatedly uncovered stories of community organizations that supported these hospitals. Churches, women's organizations and clubs, nurses, philanthropists, newspapers, and black communities in the area supported these black established hospitals by providing food, hosting fundraisers, donating furniture, and finding local women to attend the nursing schools. In one instance, Gertrude Unthink, the wife of Dr. T.C. Unthink, 
organized a dinner for packing house employees and raised $50 to hire a nurse and buy equipment for the Douglas Hospital. As another example, in its weekly publications, the Kansas City Sun, a local black newspaper, described events related to African Americans in at least 10 surrounding cities in Kansas and Missouri. The Negro Business League of, the Negro Business League of Kansas City also provided a directory in the newspaper of African American businesses in the area and urged readers to patronize them. These businesses included lawyers, bakers, barbers, physicians, cleaners, clergy members, and a host of other in inventors in the Kansas City area, but also surrounding areas such as Mexico, Missouri, where Dr. Perry previously lived. Advertisements urged readers to patronize black businesses stating, quote, your groceries and meats will cost you less and give you better satisfaction if you buy them here, quote. These ads extended to medical professionals and facilities. Just as a quick note, I'm talking, I'm speaking a lot about um, Frederica Perry, and this is Frederick Douglass's um, wife and daughters. So, uh, well, daughter and granddaughters. Um, so the the Frederica Perry is on what is your right side, on the far right. In the 1890s, black physicians from the South began to move West for several reasons, including westward expansion and black population growth. The black population in the greater Kansas City area expanded, creating the need for black physicians and medical facilities. The Exoduster movement began in 1879, bringing large numbers of African Americans into Kansas City with very few resources. By 1912, there were 23,566 African Americans in Kansas City, Missouri, and 9,286 in Kansas City, Kansas, in 1912, representing 9.7 and 11.2% of the population. Segregation prevented black, physician from treating, black physicians from treating white patients, and black patients were barred from receiving medical care at public health facilities. In response, black physicians, philanthropists, and communities in the greater Kansas City area began establishing black medical facilities. They established these facilities to address two main problems. One, black physicians and nurses needed a space to practice their profession and hone their skills. And two, black patients needed access to modern medical treatment free from judgment and racial prejudice. Black physicians established these hospitals as early as 1898 and the black communities in the area supported them throughout the 20th century. By 1919, there were 118 black established hospitals across the country, and by 1923, there were 200. I argue in my work that black women's grassroots organizing and support of these hospitals resulted in a parallel medical profession in the greater Kansas City area. Nurses, churches, women's organizations, auxiliaries, and philanthropists all played an integral role in developing the black medical profession in the West. In Kansas City, Kansas, the African, the, the American Methodist Episcopal Church supported and later became a patron of the Douglas Hospital. The AME Church encouraged its members to financially support the hospital and use it for their medical needs. The Douglas Hospital Auxiliary supported the hospital by raising funds, donating food, and buying furniture to outfit the facility. Additionally, this work will serve as an introduction to Frederica Perry, who will who I am planning to be the focus of my second monograph. One question that I address in my work is why black physicians moved to the Kansas City area during the 19th century. To do this, I needed to examine the development of medicine in the United States beginning in the mid 19th century and the use of black bodies for medical experimentation. I discuss how racism made black Americans unwitting participants in medical misconduct, one example being the Tuskegee syphilis study of the 1930s. I also discuss Dr. Marion Sims's use of black women who were enslaved in his gynecological experimentation and surgeries. These surgeries were performed without medication and under the guise of advancing medicine, and Sims directly contributed to harmful racial theories of the, of the time that persist in American medicine today. 
I would also like to note that anesthetic was available to Dr. Sims at this time, but and once he perfected his surgeries on black women without the use of anesthetic, he began conducting these surgeries on white women with an anesthetic. These experiments contributed to black distrust of the American medical profession. At the time, racial science deemed black Americans inferior to the white race, yet Sims used black women as surgical assistants, an occupation that required a high level of intelligence and judgment. These enslaved women's successful tenure as surgical nurses undermined the racial theories of the time and helped to modernize American healthcare. I also explore the movement of black people from the South, including black physicians. The exodusta movement of the late 1870s strained the meager, the meager medical resources available to black people in Kansas during that time. Black Americans fled the South due to racial terrorism and migrated to Kansas for better opportunities, but the state could not provide adequate assistance for these migrants. While the black physicians in my work were not a part of the exodusta movement, they relocated to the Eric to the area partially due to the population growth of blacks in Kansas. They moved west immediately following graduation from medical schools such as Meharry or Howard and established medical practices in the Kansas City area. One physician, Dr. John Edward Perry, graduated from Meharry and relocated to Mexico, Missouri and shortly after Columbia, Missouri. After practicing for a couple of years, he decided that he needed additional schooling and attended the postgraduate medical school in Chicago. Once Dr. Perry finished his medical school in Chicago, he moved back to, to Missouri, um, but relocated to the greater Kansas City area. In addition to population growth, there is evidence that the medical profession itself encouraged physicians to move west to establish medical practices as early as the mid 19th century and public figures, including Booker T. Washington and Daniel Hale Williams, encouraged black physicians to develop medical practices and training schools and for communities to support them however they could. For all of the figures I examine in my work, community activism and uplift were a common thread that helped these hospitals survive 20th century medical reforms. I'm speaking a lot about um, Kansas City, and so it's important for me as a Midwesterner to say, to state that there are two Kansas cities. Um, I get a lot of comments about that, and so this map shows how easy it would be for communities to work with one another because it's, it's just as easy as crossing the street and you are in Kansas City, Missouri, and then you cross another street and you're in Kansas City, Kansas. So this is a Another question that guided my research was how were these hospitals able to operate beginning in the early 20th century for over six decades? I found several answers to this question, including women's fundraising and early advocacy by black physicians. Geographically, the Kansas, the Kansas cities are situated in both former slave and free states, which complicated the status of Jim Crow laws in these cities. Communities worked and moved freely across state lines. And while Jim Crow laws did exist in the area, they were more permeable than the laws of the South. This meant that black physicians could work with white physicians and politicians to gain the trust and support of black medical establishments. One example of the permeability of Jim Crow laws in the Kansas cities is that black people were able to ride public transportation alongside white people, but were not allowed to sit in the same section of the movie theater as white sat. This is but one example that explains the fluid status of Jim Crow laws during this time. Black physicians spoke freely to white physicians and politicians about health in the black communities, and they worked to get together to solve the issues that they were seeing. This was also a period where germ theory was finally accepted by American physicians, and these physicians in Kansas City accepted the fact that bacterial diseases in black communities would also later affect white communities. One example illuminates the advocacy of black physicians and communities. Before the official start of the National Black Hospital Movement, communities in Kansas City petitioned the mayor for support of a modernized, fully equipped hospital for the service of black Americans in the greater Kansas City area. 
In 1920, Dr. A.E. Perry, who is the son of Dr. John Edward Perry and Frederica Perry, served as the head of a delegation requesting support for a new municipal hospital for Blacks, which the mayor at the time, James Cowgill, promised to support. Ahead of this petition, organizations and physicians across state lines in the Kansas cities advocated for modernized healthcare facilities for African Americans, often donating their own money and time to the cause. The call for the development of separate institutions in Kansas City was not a call for segregation, rather it provided an opportunity for black professionals to develop and control their own institutions, create networks, and eventually integrate, integrate into society. These physicians did not want segregation. They wanted to practice their craft without fear of harm or mistreatment. They, they quickly realized that society's rejection of them as professionals meant that they needed to adapt or find a new profession, something these physicians in Kansas City mentioned during the early 1900s. Separate institutions were the means to an end to segregated medical facilities. This early advocacy by black physicians established and sustained the black hospital movement in the greater Kansas City area. Black nurses, women, and community organizations were what maintained the movement. So this is a newspaper article from 1926 um, about a fashion show that I mentioned earlier that Frederica Perry held. Though at first there was a symbiotic relationship between physicians who established the hospitals and the nurses and communities that sustained them, it became clear during my research that the hospitals would have closed early on without the support of their communities. The auxiliaries of both Douglas and Wheatley Provident hospitals raised thousands of dollars for maintenance, furniture, equipment, and additional buildings. One of the fundraisers was a fashion show organized by Frederica Douglas Perry, which brought a yearly audience of up to 10,000 people, raising thousands of dollars for Wheatley Provident Hospital. The, annual, the show annually brought in anywhere from $1,200 to $1,600, which today would be around $37 to $50,000. Claude Barnett of the Chicago Defender wrote of the fashion show in 1918, stating, quote, the entire community has been behind every movement, everyone, men, women, and children, taking an interest. The subject was on every lip. All seemed to make it a personal obligation and to be anxious to do their bit, end quote. Evidence from the National Association of Colored Women reports that reports note that that organization also helped the hospitals navigate technological advancements by raising money to provide new equipment to both Wheatley and Douglas hospitals. There were several medical reforms that occurred during this period, including the Flexner Report of 1910 and the Minimum Standard Document of 1919, which sought to standardize hospital practices across the United States. One requirement of the minimum standard document is that hospitals should have access to laboratories and x-ray facilities. In the Kansas City hospitals, these women's organizations raised money specifically for the items outlined in the minimum standard document. Additionally, the black hospitals, the, additionally, the black nurses almost single-handedly ran the hospitals once they were established, many of them working for the hospitals for up to five decades. They served as hospital administrators, cooked for patients, cleaned the facilities, and trained incoming nurses and nursing students, all while performing their own nursing duties. And the work that the nurses, women's organizations, churches, and communities performed all contributed to the success of these hospitals. Their work helped the hospitals survive early, 20th, early 20th century medical reform and technological advancements. The Flexner Report of 1910 and the minimum standard document that the American College of Surgeons adopted in 1919 to, to standardize hospital facilities in the United States were detrimental to the black medical profession, partly due to new technologies that were being developed and implemented during this period. By fundraising, raising money to construct new, new buildings, buy medical equipment, and supporting nurses training facilities, the women's organizations and communities in Kansas City helped the black hospital survive. One question that I, I'm just gonna preemptively answer, um, a question that I usually get um, during my talks is what about the midwives? 
um, to just answer that outright. Midwives were not a part of my research, unfortunately, and they were not a part of my research because they were not considered to be professionals in medicine at this time. Um, there's a long history of pushing midwives from the medical profession, and this holds true in my research as well. So I know that midwives absolutely continued their work in Kansas City during this period, but they weren't considered a part of the hospital movement and didn't work alongside the Black hospitals. Following the discussion of the main actors and their work during early American medical reforms, I discussed the impact of World War I on Black people in the United States and on medicine. Around 404,000 African Americans served in the military during the World War I, 40,000 overseas, and 20,000 in combat. The United States was not equipped to handle returning veterans' medical crises after their return. Black newspapers provided details about the lack of support Black veterans received from the government and continued questioning Black participation in U.S. wars. Following several debates, the government established Tuskegee Veterans Hospital in 1923 in Tuskegee, Alabama for Black veterans. Equipped to handle only 600 patients, the hospital was not nearly enough to address the needs of returning Black veterans, but the creation of this hospital in part sparked the Black hospital movement of 1920s. From the onset, the NAACP was against a segregated hospital, but once the establishment of the Veterans Hospital was inevitable, they demanded that it be African-American operated. I discussed some of the debates surrounding the maintenance of the hospital and KKK terrorism of Black, hospitals, um, black ho doctors and locals in Tuskegee, Alabama. The KKK ran black physicians out of Tuskegee and increased their already violent tactics toward African-American citizens in the city. Something that I found interesting um, in my research regarding the KKK in Kansas City specifically, I found a newspaper article um, that the KKK donated money to the black hospitals in Kansas City. And it really perplexed me for a while about why they would do that. But for them, it was a way to continue segregation. And so their motivations were a lot different than um, the motivations of black hospitals in creating the separate facilities. I also discuss the black hospital movement and the unforeseen outcomes of the movement. At the time, a hospital for black people operated by black people was seen as a positive outcome of the movement. Black physicians, nurses, nurses and ad administrators had a place they could practice their profession and gain necessary skills and black people could access medical care free from racial terrorism. But these hospitals were mainly established in urban areas which did not address the healthcare needs of the rural black populations across the United States. In my research, I found that due to establishing black hospitals in urban areas, African Americans in rural settings received less medical care and had an increased risk of morbidity and mortality. White hospitals began to refuse to treat black people in any instance, whereas before they might treat them in emergencies. This is a photo of Juliet Derricote, who was a victim of medical racism at this time. She was the Dean of Women at Fisk University in Nashville and was traveling to her parents' home in Atlanta when she was involved in a car accident. Her car overturned in a ditch and the other driver got out of his car, yelled at Mrs. Derricote and her students for damaging his vehicle and left the scene. The closest hospital in Dalton, Georgia refused to render aid to her and her students and she was taken to the home of a local African-American woman to rest while her friends determined the best course of action. It took her friends six hours to locate a hospital that would treat her and another one of her passengers, Ms. Nina Johnson, and they secured hospital or they secured transportation to a hospital in Chattanooga, which was 35 miles away. Mrs. Derricote died on the way, and Mrs. Johnson died the next day. Both the Committee on Interracial Cooperation and the NAACP investigated this incident, which is documented in the NAACP papers. The case of Mrs. Derrico is one of many from across the nation document, documented in newspapers and NAACP papers from that time. Okay. 
As I move through the 1920s and into the 1930s, I write about increased pessimism surrounding the creation of black hospitals by black organizations, including many members of the NAACP, black physicians and activists. A, a short discussion of W.E.B. Du Bois and his work is helpful. During this period, he wrote about segregated educational institutions. While he generally agrees with the NAACP's stance on segregated institutions, he provides a more nuanced discussion of the matter, considering the status of race and racism in the United States at the time. Now, I cautiously mention Du Bois because while he's, act, uh, he's absolutely relevant to the later discussion on segregated hospitals, he's not a focus of my work and I'm not a scholar of Du Bois. However, I will note that his view on self-segregation during this period was a tactical maneuver to, quote, obtain the admission of the colored group to cooperation and incorporation into the white group on the best possible terms, end quote. His ultimate objective in suggesting self-segregation at this time was eventual full integration. He also notes that the idea of a separate economy and self-segregation was a decision reached by force. Another final important note of context is that the head of the NAACP in Chicago, the Chicago Defender, and Dr. Lewis T. Wright were all ideologically opposed to Du Bois at this time. So much of what is published in the newspapers, particularly the Chicago Defender, about the subject at this time was in direct op opposition to Du Bois. So they were using newspapers to fight with each other. I conclude my work during the 1930s while there are heated discussions surrounding black hospitals and increasing calls for integration the black hospitals in kansas city survived this period of disillusion one of the fundraisers that frederica perry organized in the 19 teens was still being held in the late 1930s by the organizations she founded bringing over 10,000 to the city and raising thousands of dollars each year Additionally, both hospitals operated for seven decades in Kansas City. Early 20th century black nurses, activists, and physicians were progenitors of the National Black Hospital Movement, which occurred during the 1920s following the creation of Tuskegee Veterans Hospital. Their efforts to professionalize black medicine beginning in the 1890s created the conditions that made it possible for the later national movement to occur. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cola. And uh, that was an uh, absolutely fascinating uh, worldwide tour, basically, of what went on in Kansas City, but its implications nationwide. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Uh, we're open for comments or questions from the audience or from uh, Zoom. I'm, I'm a retired physician, but I was I graduated medical school in 61, so I saw some of that. And what you demonstrate was a widespread bigotry of the time. And just as they required the establishment of black hospitals, in every city with a large Jewish population, there's a Sinai hospital for the very same reason. And so we've made a lot of progress, a tremendous amount. Uh, unfortunately, the black medical schools were not of the same caliber as some of the other medical schools, but it was the best you could do. And they're trying to raise that standard, but um, it, it's just one of the facts of what was happening. But uh, it was only recently that we realized that um, you have to include everybody. I know I was taught when I was in training that African-Americans did not have a problem with glaucoma. And that's not true at all. They just weren't receiving health care, medical care. They have the same problems as everyone else, but they're an underserved population. I have to say that by the time I was in medical school, we weren't serving everybody, and we were admitting everybody. So we, we made considerable progress from the time you described. Yes. Um, you mentioned the Jewish hospitals. I have a colleague. Um, who does work on Jewish hospitals, Dr. Natalia Alexian in the history department at UF. 
and she came to my job talk and um, she was so excited to speak afterwards because she said that the the work that I'm doing, some of the hospitals, the Jewish hospitals that she does research on, um, they moved along the same lines as the black hospitals and there were also women's only hospitals as well. Um, so I think all of these contributed to what we see today um, is generally full integration of the hospitals in, you know, in the United States. So absolutely a tremendous amount of progress has been made since that time. Thank you so much for your question. Other questions or comments? Uh, you, you talked a lot about uh, the uh, implications of uh, the uh, hospital uh, development before the hospital movement for uh, the uh, African American struggle. Uh, could you talk, talk about the implications in Kansas City area of the development of the black community? Because it seemed like there was sort of a give and take between you know development of community and development of the support for uh, the the health uh, systems there. Absolutely. Um, this is one of the areas that I'm really like, I'm excited to continue doing research on. Um, most of the primary sources that I look at are the newspapers because newspapers are some of the only documents that we have left um, primary sources from that time. Um, so I'm looking at these newspapers and they were so community focused. And so not only were they helping these medical facilities become more professionalized and established, um, they were in, in, encouraging, um, you know, patronizing, like I said, other black businesses. And so in doing this and in getting the word out and then um, suggest, not suggesting, but um, encouraging education as well and cleanliness, they encouraged um, what was called during that time National Negro Health Week, um, which the United States uh, Public Health Service um, helped support. Um, and so they would publish a weekly schedule of um, like a to-do list. So on this day, we're going to focus on cleaning out your house and having um, fresh air come into your house. And on this day, on Tuesday, um, we're going to focus on dental health. And then Wednesday is children's health. Um, and so all of these things, they kind of intimately understood that we're going to help their communities um, become more integrated in society. And so um, we see during that time that just and a, a closeness of the communities that um, that really helped the medical profession kind of survive. And like I said, these hospitals um, survived up to seven decades and one of them merged with another hospital in the in the 1970s. And so it actually never ceased to exist. It just became integrated, which was the original goal. So when I was looking at the charter of the hospital from 1898, they said that they were established to help all who needed health care. They were not established to help just one population. Um, and they and that rang true, actually. Um, and just another note that I'm thinking now that I'm thinking of it, um, Kansas in particular has a large Latino population. And um, up until 1923, um, Mexican people specifically were considered, they had to go to the black hospitals and black medical facilities. And at, at 1923, for some reason that changed. And then they were able to go to the whites only hospitals. And so there's also a change in the status of race for certain populations at that time. Um, but overall, they absolutely focused. I think the focus was more on community development as opposed and just the work that they did for the medical facilities was a byproduct of that. Thank you for your question. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Well, thank you for coming today. And I, I'm just wondering if there's any correlation too with the survival rate of the people who went to the various hospitals and the location because if a black person had to travel much further to the nearest hospital, that certainly would seem to make a huge difference. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so a lot of the primary sources that we have related to that really are the black newspapers. Unfortunately, um, either documentation was not kept during the early 1900s, um, they didn't really begin. I know that the hospitals did not really begin taking adequate 
um, documentation of their patients until like the 1930s. Um, so what we are seeing are newspaper articles um, writing about black people who died. Um, and it is absolutely, you know, the, the urban centers that had black uh, medical facilities, um, they took care of those, the patients in the community that were directly in the surrounding areas and towns, but the further out you lived, the more likely it was that you would, you know, um, you would have an increased chances of morbidity and mortality. And so I do not have the actual data yet. That is something that I am currently compiling because it's difficult to do that when you only have newspaper articles, but um, that is something that I'm trying to come up with some stat um, statistics about the rates, the specific rates. Um, but we absolutely know that um, in rural areas and in Kansas and Missouri, there are many rural areas. So um, many of the people in rural areas were still on their own for medical care. And I think that could be another point of research for other people is that if um, African-Americans in the rural areas weren't receiving care from the urban centers, were the midwives the ones who were stepping in? Um, so I think that that could have absolutely been the case in that at that time. Thank you. Uh, your research uh, focused a lot on nurses and doctors that moved into the Kansas City area and sustained it, but particularly on uh, activists and uh, those who sought support financially and in other ways for the, the hospitals and, and other clinics. Um, what, what does it tell you about uh, the strength, uh, the agency of, of black women in the community and how they were able to, to um, build on, on their relations with the community members to organize and uh, provide such support? I think it's exactly because they didn't have any other option that it was a forced decision to rely upon one another in the communities. And so they knew just simply based on segregation and Jim Crow laws that they were not going to be taken care of. Um, and so I think that because of that, they were forced into, um, they were forced into being, you know, being leaders in their communities. And so I see Frederica Perry um, in most of these primary sources, and she's the granddaughter, like I said, of Frederick Douglass, and many aren't aware of the work that she did. She did a tremendous amount of work, I would say, even on par with that of her grandfather, and people don't really know about her, um, just because of the way that women were treated during that time. Um, but we also know, I also, I have a friend who, um, she received her PhD in sociology at the University of Kansas. She wrote a book on um, women's organizations in Kansas City as well. And she said that the difference that she's seeing between my work and hers is that um, for white women, they were able to create these organizations because they were in a higher um, economic class. And so their husbands were working, they were wealthy. And so they were able to participate in these organizations, but black women, that is actually different. And so what I see in my work is that black women of all economic statuses, whether they were working class or like Frederica Perry had a husband who was a physician, they all contributed to the organizations. And I think that does speak to the strength of the communities in that area, because they allowed and actively encouraged women from all economic statuses to participate. And I think that's what made them so strong. Great. Thank you so much. Other comments, questions? Anybody from Zoom? Okay, good. So I had another question that that dealt with uh, the aftermath of World War I, mm -hmm. and, and that's some um, of the uh, influenza epidemic, which I read a book uh, uh, recently that talked about it, the fact that basically it started in uh, army bases uh, and the, in the military where uh, soldiers were gathering and they couldn't figure out what was going on, but it really you know, took over. And perhaps you had some insight into it in terms of the Tuskegee uh, Veterinary Hospital, sorry, Veterans Hospital. <laughs> 
Yes, absolutely. So I'm um, actually, there isn't a lot of work on the flu in Kansas during that time. And I'm just, I've been thinking like, maybe that's a book that I need to write because I've done a lot of research during that period, uh, particularly during the pandemic um, when we were all stuck in our houses. And I'm like, okay, I want to see if there are any um, similarities between what happened during the Spanish flu and what is happening during 2020. Um, and that was the point that I was doing a lot of my research and I was writing my dissertation. Um, there like, so there are not any books on the flu, um, in Kansas city during that time. All I have are some primary sources that I've located, but I do know that the black physicians in, um, that were part of my research were, actively encouraging um, health guidelines to black communities. And it's simple. It, I mean, they're the same um, suggestions that we had during the 2020 pandemic, which was masking um, and keeping your uh, keeping your the, the air in your house clean by opening your windows, just getting fresh air, certain things like that, um, that they were encouraging, uh, washing your hands. Um, and that it, the washing your hands is uh, particularly interesting because just 20 years before there was a nurse who noted that she had to actively tell the physicians to wash their hands in the 1920s because that was when germ theory was finally being accepted. Um, and so she had to, she remembered, you know, reminding them that they needed to wash their hands in between tr uh, treating patients, but then not 20 years later, they were actively encouraging that among um, their communities. So, um, and then you asked about the Tuskegee Veterans Hospital. Um, I don't, I don't have a lot of um, information about how the flu impacted Tuskegee Veterans Hospital, um, but I do have some primary sources from um, soldiers who were treated there. I have primary sources um, from before that hospital was established by the federal government. Um, that indicated the need for this hospital to be um, to be developed. And so there were hospitals that were um, specific to veterans and some of them would hold maybe 20 beds for African-American soldiers and the rest were for white soldiers. Um, and then there are newspaper articles um, really indicating, I think they called battle, battle neuroses during that time, which is what we, commonly referred to now as PTSD um, in some of these soldiers. And so some of the soldiers coming back and not receiving any type of health care and then um, committing pretty atrocious um, crimes in, because they were um, unable to receive mental or emotional health care. Um, so there's a lot that is happening during that period of time. That's also, you know, I, I wrote about, or I told you about the KKK donating money to the black hospitals. This was also a time during the second kind of increased wave of participation in the KKK during that time. Um, so there's just a lot of context that's happening, you know, um, during that time. Um, but I think the flu is one of the significant subjects that has been understudied in Kansas City. And so it's something that I, I might have to do it if I don't see someone else who's done it before I publish this book. I also had another question about uh, strategy and tactics regarding segregation and integration. Uh, of course, it was played out at the, the national level. And mm -hmm. a lot of it was like, well, when should there be integration rather than, you know, whether um, it should take place uh, at all? Um, but it, it is certainly the the results in some ways were positive, but had some negative effects of building, you know, black institutions, um, as you noted, that had some at least short term effects in the rural areas. So. But you know, it, just bringing us up to sort of the current day, um, uh, when, when did uh, integration in the health system take place in, in Kansas City, and what was the process? 
So I think that is a little contested. And the reason I say that is because there is a hospital, I think in the 1940s, the late 1940s, called Queen of the World Hospital, which is officially known as the first integrated hospital in Kansas City. Um, but as I mentioned before, the charter of these Black hospitals stated that they treated everybody. And that was as early as 1898. And so officially, I think... Um, historians and scholars have stated that this happened um, after World War um, after World War II, the Hill Burton Act prevented um, public hospitals from receiving public money, um, money, federal government money um, if they were not, if they were segregated, they couldn't receive money to help support their hospital. And so I think the Hill Burton Act is something that really, um, changed the hospitals and the the view on segregation was really about that time. And that was nationwide, um, but that affected Kansas City as well. And so the Queen of the World Hospital is the officially known hospital, um, the official first integrated hospital in Kansas City. Um, but that is also one of the reasons why I stop my research. My research stops at 1940, because I think there's this is a period of time that they're in transition and things are completely changing there. These hospitals, the black hospitals, uh, excuse me, the black, the black hospitals um, survived up until the 1970s, but there is a period of transition happening um, during and after World War II that completely changed the climate. Um, and so I think, you know, that would be what I would say is the 1940s officially, but we see it happening much earlier in Kansas City. I also think that's why Kansas City is a different case. I think it's an interesting case study because um, we know that the that Jim Crow laws affected Kansas Cityans differently than they did people in the South and in the North. Um, and so it's it's something that's interesting to me to make a case that Kansas City operated in a different way because of being located in former free and slave state. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, any last questions or comments? So let's thank uh, Dr. Cole for an absolutely fascinating presentation.